or you can take it away. You'll need to get a little closer to the speaker. You're a little bit on the soft side. Okay. Is that better? That's mm -hmm. better. Okay, thanks. Well, good afternoon mm -hmm. to everyone. I want to take a, a moment just to thank all of you for participating in this was webinar and offer my personal thanks to Steve for the invitation to participate. I've looked over the list of participants and read some of the notes you submitted with your photographs. And I must say, you all are doing a lot of great work for the benefit of students everywhere. I celebrate you and, and what your contributions to environmental education have been thus far. Your work is very refreshing and a huge inspiration in the field of environmental science. In my work during the past 11 years, I've had the opportunity to visit several schools and have interacted with hundreds of educators and school administrators. I've been inspired by a lot of what I've seen, but I've also become a little bit troubled by the lack of continuity in science instruction. Science curriculums, um, the way I'm beginning to see it happen, they're falling apart. They're crumbling under the weight of just one single strong teacher leaving a particular school. Observing this has been my force behind wanting to share a little bit of what my experience has been in the hope that it inspires you to extend your knowledge and expertise towards building a water science incubator within your own respective school districts. I'm using the term incubator because it reminds me of a place where things are hatched or where they are kept warm for the long term. Now, my outreach at, M uh, at MMSD has been impacted by the changes, and I'm sure that many of your school districts are experiencing some of the same changes, changes in leadership, transitional teachers being changed in schools, changed grades, and so forth. But even with all of the change, as unpredictable as it is, I think it's a great opportunity um, that is going to benefit us all. And I think I have shifted something. Uh, Cora, I'm going to hand off the screen to you. Okay. Um, I took it back just a moment while you were talking. Okay. And okay, are we all set? All right, now you just need to click on the button that should show up on your screen. Okay. There you go. Now, do I need to close, um, Steve? No, nope, you're good. Okay. Yep, your PowerPoint is up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hide this bar, or is it safe to do that? No, it's actually not visible to the viewers, so all okay. I see is your PowerPoint, so you're, you're okay. ready to go. Okay. Well, the goals of the webinar are listed here. I'm not going to take time to review all of these, but I, do, I have listed them here in hopes that we can all be on the same page for what we were going to get out of the time we spend together, and that is basically to gain a basic understanding of what it means to have a more sustainable watershed-based based education platform and to identify some of the barriers to implementing and sustaining a watershed-focused curriculum and a little bit about why the barriers exist. And hopefully um, it will stimulate some thought to you to start beginning to identify some of the potential partners and resources uh, to begin removing some of those barriers. These are some of the things that we're going to be covering. I'm sure your questions may cause us to deviate just a little bit. But for the sake of those that might be new in education or maybe just beginning their understanding of a watershed, we are going to quickly uh, review the definition of a watershed. And we um, are going to identify a, you know, potential collaborators in your school district using MMSD's programs as a model. And we are. Um, also going to review a few successful and not so successful uh, academic experiences. And hopefully time uh, will permit for you to share some of your experiences. And uh, lastly, we will have an overview of some resources that I've come to rely on. Just a moment, I want to share with you MMSD's vision, mission and vision, because it does direct everything that we do, including our outreach. Our primary mission is to cost effectively provide a quality of management of the region's water quality resources. We envision, the vision includes a healthier Milwaukee 
and I'm sorry, Steve, that that screen is blocking me. Oh, and Cora, we have a question. I'll just go ahead and answer it. One person okay. is asking, what is MMSD? It's uh, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. Okay. Which has a keen interest in raising watershed awareness um, as part of maintaining water quality and quantity. Okay. So I'll hand it back to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. What MMSD does, um, our vision is to to um, create a healthier Milwaukee region and a cleaner Lake Michigan and accomplish it through leadership that results in us having zero overflows. A lot of people say that that's not possible, but some of the work that we're doing um, now, engaging the community as we are, we're beginning to realize that it potentially could happen, and that's a vision that is leading our work through the year 2035. Our watershed incubator is really based upon nature's boundaries. Looking at the watersheds and how they're inhabited, how the land is being used, helps us to plan with a regional focus. MMSD uh, serves 28 different communities. Um, we use the watershed, the boundaries of nature's boundaries, to lay the foundation for our intermunicipal understanding and collaboration. It helps us to identify and prioritize product uh, projects and allows us to focus on areas that have the greatest um, adverse impact on water quality during weather events. Watershed, we, we begin with the watershed funnel idea. And I love this graphic. I think in its simplicity, it really describes very, very well what happens in a watershed. If you think of land as a funnel, it, it's capturing water, storm water, it's uh, capturing other types of precipitation. And as it um, melts and flows, it's draining to its lowest point and into common waterways. This particular slide, I think, illustrates very well what happens in a watershed. A watershed is an area of land that captures water and drains it to a particular body of water. Now, the slopes of the land are going to dictate which way that water flows. They all go to the lowest point, but eventually they all will gravitate to a larger body of water downstream. This particular slide just shows different images of, of a watershed. We all live in one, and every day we're having an impact on our watershed, whether you're in rural areas or whether you uh, happen to be in uh, heavily forested areas where the natural land has pretty much been left undisturbed, whether it's in your neighborhood where you have some pavement that's starting to be introduced on the sidewalks and the roadways, or even in the more densely populated areas, our urban areas, where everything pretty much is covered with pavement. We all live in a watershed, and how that land is used is going to have an impact on what's happening. Now, at MMSD, we cons do consider ourselves partners for a cleaner environment. Everything that we do, we try to protect Lake Michigan as best as we possibly can. And for those of you that don't know, um, we treat wastewater as our primary core mission. And we discharge um, our wastewater once it's treated, our, our effluent is released back into Lake Michigan. We have uh, been able to successfully capture 98.3% of all of the wastewater and combine stormwater um, and clean it before it's put back into Lake Michigan since 1994. It has taken billions of dollars uh, to construct a storage tunnels such as our deep tunneling system um, that is 300 feet below ground. It can store up to 521 million gallons of combined stormwater and sanitary waste. Um, it is 28.5 miles long, and at its widest point, it's about 32 um, miles, uh, excuse me, 32 feet in diameter. It is designed to minimize basement backups and to keep overflows down to one to two occurrences per year. But what we found is even with all of the investment that has been made, all of the improvements to the system, all of our increases in capacity to store, we're still having beach closings. And that's even when there's no sewer overflows. And so we started looking at that fact, OK, beaches are closed. There was no sewer overflows occurring. Where is all of the um, bacteria 
and all of the other um, pollutants coming from in the water. Our attention was directed to this slide, and I know it's kind of a busy slide, but it's one that really contains a lot of important information, and it really started to begin to direct our work. If you look at the pie chart in 1975, it shows a distribution of pollutants that were found in the greater Milwaukee watersheds. And I draw your attention to the combined sewer overflows, which is uh, the light blue shaded area, 49%, and compared to what was found in 2000, where it's been reduced to a much substantially smaller percentage. Um, to be exact, it's been reduced to about 2%. Um, also, if you look at the urban and non-agricultural runoff, at 23% in 1975, you can see that it has substantially increased to 68%. And so we're looking at the dynamics and the changes of the distribution of the different types of pollutants, and this is what's driving us. If we're getting the greatest amount of pollution from urban and non-agricultural runoff, should not we be focusing our attention on that? Uh, that does not mean that we don't pay attention to over sewer overflows and combined sewer overflows, but we also um, um, want to look at the major sources. And that means involving the community. Um, so that's what we've start begun to do. We are focusing on abating the stormwater runoff. To help us do that, we've designed a couple of education programs. I'll go through these very quickly. One of them is a household hazardous waste collection program. The other is a medicine collection program. We have begun to work with other um, groups to educate the people about protecting water, the, part, the role that they can play by keeping these excess unused pharmaceuticals and other toxic prop, um, solutions out of our waterways. We also have been working throughout the region. We, we've created a regional unity whereby we can encourage everyone, educate them about them, and examine the problems together, looking at uh, the county level, uh, how land is used, how we can protect um, land from development, those uh, pieces of land that are uh, crucial pieces of land along a waterway, such as our green, screen, green seams program that has uh, resulted in us purchasing and protecting 2,600 acres of land. Uh, at the county level, we are installing different types of water retention so that we can slow that stormwater down so that it's not such an adverse impact on the sewer system. We have also formed an alliance throughout the region where all of the municipalities that we serve in our region are coming together to, in order to develop uh, solutions to these problems. And we've also initiated some programs to educate and empower others to do. You, we know that uh, sometimes the understanding of some of the problems that are of the pollution that goes on in the watershed, um, it, we understand them, but we lack the resources in order to really take action against it. So we realized that in some of the programs that we started were some match um, grant uh, programs that would allow uh, different corporations to put in green roofs. Um, and, and to work with uh, residential and commercial um, interest groups in putting in, in rain gardens. And we developed a rain, par, uh, rain barrel program, and we have had an excellent result of our rain barrel program here. Since it's a program, it, excuse me, since inception, we have distributed almost 19,000 rain barrels. And finally, we've created a website where people can use the H2O capture that you see in the lower right hand of this slide um, is a way that a person can go and they can educate themselves. There's a lot of calculation tools that's built into that where if somebody's deciding to put in a rain garden, they can get, a, get an idea of the environmental as well as the financial benefits to them if they were to decide to take that route on their personal property. So with that, we're going, I'm going to pause right here. I know that there may be questions. Yep, we do have some questions, Cora. Okay. Um, Mary Kozub, who works for the McHenry County Conservation District just across the border in Illinois, is wondering if MMSD, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, has education explicitly in its mission. 
Absolutely. That is a huge component of what we do because we know if the public does not understand, and that's students all the way up through the municipal ranks, legislative bodies, if the public does not understand the work that we're doing, uh, we're finding that it's, it's just not a good thing. People need to be aware of why we're doing what we're doing. So education is definitely a key component. Uh, the mission that I shared at the beginning, that was the one-liner that we give, but that um, the strategic planning um, that we do uh, and renew every other year uh, definitely highlights the need for education. Yes, and um, we have a couple questions here. Uh, people from different locations in Chicago and in Michigan wondering if there are organizations doing similar work. I assume there are, Cora, but um, you probably see them at conferences and such. If there are organizations doing similar work at the cities that are listening in. So we have people listening in from Cleveland and Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago, and Muskegon. I am aware of at the city of Milwaukee, which we are not a part of the city of Milwaukee. We are considered um, a, a separate um, quasi-governmental body. Uh, we do uh, definitely work closely with the city of Milwaukee, but they have established their own uh, Department of Sustainability. And part of that is working with residents, working with the entire city of Milwaukee for people that have an interest um, and with schools as well to share, begin to share some of the sustainability uh, concepts with, um, you know, with the people so that everybody has a better understanding. Um, there's also several, there's UW Extension here. Several of our nature centers also host a lot of these educational forums. And MMSD has come to form partnerships with them, so we're involved in some of those things, and then some of them we're not. In some cases, we're just sharing resources in order to empower other organizations to take the lead on some of the education. If I can just follow up on that question, though, um, I'm assuming there are sewage districts in, in those cities that, um, that, that people listening in from other locations could uh, potentially follow up okay. and see if they have education as part of their mission? Okay, now for, we are the largest wastewater treatment facility here in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, we serve 28 communities, 1.1 million customers in a 411 square mile area. The, the, that includes all of the, all of Milwaukee County and surrounding areas. It does not include South Milwaukee, which has its own wastewater treatment facility. Uh, the city of Madison has its own, and there are other communities that do have their own uh, wastewater treatment facility, but most of uh, my experience has been directly with the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District Service Area. Okay. So those listening in from other locations, uh, like I know here in Madison, uh, can, you can take a tour of the sewage treatment plant and they have education and mission. For those in other cities, I'd encourage you to check out how sewage is treated in your areas. Um, here in the upper Midwest, we have the largest problem in the country with combined sewer overflows because uh, the, the, our cities tend to be a little, at, the, at the time when people were combining um, stormwater with sewage in the pipes underground. So there's a big problem across the region, and people from all the cities that are listening into this webinar that Cora was getting at with that one slide about reducing problems with what are called combined sewer overflows. So I'd encourage you to, to read up on that problem, because um, I know each of the cities listening in has that, have that as an issue for water quality. Okay, but if I could just clarify one point on that, and then we can uh, move on. Um, in our service area, 411 square mile service area, there's only 5% of that service area that actually has combined sewers. Okay, so it's the large, it's like the core of the larger city part of your service area? Yes, it is. Now, yeah. uh, even though it's a small area doing a major rain event or a, or a huge snow melt event, um, you would believe it's the entire system, but it, it truly is not. It's a smaller portion of the system. Um, uh, but there's, you know, pros and cons to both uh, capturing um, stormwater and combining it with sewer waste and treating it because we can get a lot of the pollutants out before it goes into the lake, uh, back into the lake. Um, but the bigger problem occurs with the polluted stormwater runoff for those storm drains that lead directly to waterways. Mm -hmm. And so the, if the majority of our system is leading directly to waterways, that that water does not get treated. 
there's no chance of getting any of the pollutants out of it. And that's where uh, Earth Partnership rain gardens can be part of the solution? That's where it comes. To, that's the exact connection we make. So. Excellent. Well, we have a couple other questions, but I'll hold those here, Corey. If we have time at the end, I'll come back to them. Okay, great. And I assume we'll have other questions that come up along the way as well. Okay. Well, I tried to touch, impress on the idea, even the systems you build for controlling uh, combined sewer, uh, 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 sewer waste and stormwater is no limit to them. I mean, as our rain events get bigger and on and on and on, um, we have to stop and realize, okay, how big of a system can we really build? Can we build a system large enough to contain all of this? So the truth of the matter is it's not realistic to even expect that we can accomplish that. So our outreach, when we initially started the program, we went into schools and we would talk about wastewater treatment and we would uh, to develop a student-friendly PowerPoint presentation and we give them handouts to take home. But we saw that that wasn't enough. So now we are working more with organizations and other professional groups. We're adopting schools um, to share research sources with them to expand their environmental focuses. We are providing um, classroom uh, resources and service learning projects. And we're empowering the, com uh, the community to take action. So we work with all different sorts of schools, community organizations, other environmental organi organizations, and the like. Now, these are two images that have motivated me. And I, I don't know if Kathy Palmer is on the uh, webinar today. But if she is, she's featured in that picture that's on the right. Oh, yeah, uh, I see her Yes, she is, um, uh, has worked with Urban Ecology Center, which is one of our stellar, stellar um, uh, nature centers here in the urban Milwaukee area. But when you look at the picture on, on the left, that's what I was experiencing when I go into a classroom and just talking to students. They were falling asleep on me pretty much. Um, and when I became part of a teacher's group, and at that time called the West Family Science Group, and we hosted a Family Science Day, this is one of the activities. This is the type of engagement that you see in the young man there just looking at um, the, um, the tiny organism that they're finding in river water that was brought in for him to look at under a microscope. So let's kind of change gears and take a look at the connection. And these are connections I'm sure that all of you are uh, familiar with. And I'm going to apologize up front. I hear that the the um, quote from John Muir that's listed at the bottom that says, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. I've seen some rebuttals saying that that's not what he said and that he was misquoted. But I tend to favor what it says there because I think it is really true. The interconnectedness of the environment really gives us clues about everything that's going on. But the connection um, with education and the environment and a student's uh, self-esteem has been phenomenal. When you take them outside and they begin to observe and ask questions and explore uh, and even document some of the things that they're finding, they are really looking at the environment as a window to the world. And they're really beginning to see that every living thing is interconnected in some way and that it ha what they're doing has an impact on the environment. And when they can identify a problem and um, contribute to a solution, that really does elevate their esteem, uh, self-esteem, and directly connects them to the environment. So our outreach has come to the point where we want uh, not only uh, people in schools, but in the community to realize that whether or not you have a creek or a stream or a river or a lake that's flowing by you, Somehow, some way, you are having a, um, a direct impact on Lake Michigan, regardless of where, where you are um, in this region. And when I make those comments, I'm focusing on the, the major watersheds, watersheds that are tributary to Lake Michigan. And there are six of them. Now, what you're seeing here is a map of some schools that we had the pleasure of working with this summer. And we want to give them, uh, provide them a map so our GIS department came up with a mapping system to show all of the schools that were involved in a professional development that we had to, so that they would know where the closest waterways are to their school. 
And I think that that's a good way of connecting students to um, and help them develop a sense of place in their particular watershed. Now, bringing a watershed to life, you know all of the sciences that are there. Um, when we look at the buildings, the land, the trees, and the plants that are there on the land, it's so many sciences that come out of this. Um, and I just want to briefly highlight, and I'm sure that you can see them for yourself, but I just wanted us to spend a moment thinking about the amount of science that comes out of looking at um, the watershed. And we have agronomy, we have botany, we have um, oceanography, we have uh, climatology that's coming out of it. We can even look at engineering, and we can look at um, um, aquatic life, and all types of sciences, all of them in, interconnected, and all of them giving us clues about what's going on in the watershed. So um, in my opinion, watersheds um, and the focusing on watersheds can bring together so many different aspects of learning in the classroom. It's also an excellent resource for, for students to be able to not only have an interdisciplinary focus on what they're looking at in the classroom, but also to use technology to pull it all together. All of the core subject areas can be directly tied to the environment. Now there are some barriers, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of this, but there are safety concerns. There's lack of resources and training. There's a perceived complexity. A lot of teachers think, oh, no, take my kids outside. Are you kidding? They don't know how to behave in the classroom. They certainly wouldn't know how to conduct themselves outside. So there is a perception that it would be more difficult than easier to take uh, students outdoors for learning. And it is a very new concept for many of the teachers that I talk to. Other barriers have. Um, uh, arisen from the various changes in leadership, the fluctuation among educators, lack of education, excuse me, administrative support, and the lack of scaffolding. Um, I've witnessed on many, many occasions where you may have a very strong science teacher at one grade, and then they go, the students go to the next grade, and the science may be totally absent from that particular year of learning, and as a result, they lose some of um, they don't have the continuity. They don't have the building blocks that they need to really grasp some of the scientific concepts. There's a, just a lot of uh, programming and consistencies overall. And hopefully you can think about some of the things that are going on in your respective school districts. What are the barriers um, to watershed science education in your schools and school districts? Do you feel that um, uh, much we've accomplished more than we since 2006, and some of the information that I have is relatively old, but I think it's very applicable to what we're experiencing today. Um, and also think about how you can um, help make watershed science part of your school culture. And I think once it's part of the school culture, there's a likelihood that the programming in place will continue to grow and build, and you will finally achieve the building blocks that's needed in um, strong science curriculum in the school. And then also think about what projects have you thought to implement? Why were you successful? Why uh, were they successful? Why or why not? And I think exploring those things are going to help if we revisit them and try to figure out what went wrong. I think the climate is good right now in, in the academic world to try, and, try it again and make it more successful than maybe it was in the past. Okay, I'm going to take a pause here again for questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one teacher who teaches at the high school level who's wondering, Cora, um, if you're aware of good sources, he's thinking of like a debate activity and a research activity, good sources regarding comparing infrastructure costs and statistics to different ways of solving some of these problems of uh, managing stormwater? I don't know of a particular forum where that is going on. I've heard of some of the, that going on at some of the, now, I guess I want to know, is he from this area or another area? 
Uh, I'd um, have to scroll back up. Uh, okay. Or if whoever asked that question, because I'm going all the way up here. Jeff I know Schu here locally I've heard of some debates that go on and like at the here in Milwaukee at the School of Engineering where <laughs> students are preparing for some of the uh, engineering fields that may be important to uh, water quality management and wastewater treatment and they are having some of those debates and they're having panelists and they're having profession, uh, professional engineers and so forth to come in and interact with them yeah. um, and to tell them what type of proposal writing they should be doing, what kinds of questions they should be asking, um, if they are faced with, if they're part of uh, major projects that are going to be rede redesigning infrastructure and so, things of that nature. So the School of Engineering, and I would think universities overall, would yes. be a good place to start. Yeah, our questioner on that one is, uh, his name is Jeff Schumacher. He's from our group uh, in Illinois. And mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff, I'll say uh, from the work I've done with Earth Partnership, for example, we partner, one of our advisors is uh, Ken Potter, who's, who's known around the country. He's a civil and environmental engineer at UW-Madison. So that's an example of somebody from the university who has a, a tremendous uh, wealth of knowledge. Where you, you, One of um, Dr. Potter's suggestions is that he used to get laughed at was that rain gardens can actually be part of a, a larger scale solution to the issue of stormwater management rather than just more concrete and more pipes, which is historically how civil engineers have tried to solve this, this problem of stormwater management. Mm -hmm. So connecting with people like that uh, at nearby uh, universities and colleges, um, I think would be a good, sort, a good place to start. Uh, but Jeff would be happy to have a follow-up conversation as well, perhaps uh, over email uh, individually. I'm just checking other questions. Um, let's see. Cora, we have one question here, uh, and actually this is also applicable to, to me in the work I do. Karen, uh, Karen16 is the username here, is wondering about uh, explaining in the simplest form how to make a rain garden. Karen, what I, uh, I'll offer my suggestion, and then Corey, you can chime in here as well. We have a rain garden. So Karen, you, uh, the Earth Partnership Program that's, that's running this webinar series that I work for does 40-hour, you know, week-long summer institutes for teachers on just that question. We have a rain garden curriculum where we, it's a kind of an interdisciplinary curriculum. I've worked with teachers from all ages and subject areas. By the end of the week, they walk out of that institute uh, with ideas for how their students can take the lead on planning and designing and installing a rain garden. So it's not something that the teacher is doing. It's, it's the, the program provides a framework for students to, to take the lead. Uh, okay. So I'll post, Karen, I'll post something on that at, uh, at the bottom of the wiki page for today's webinar just to, to show you that, that resource which is available online. Cora, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, now I'm not knowing where she is from. I can say that here in the Metro Milwaukee area, we're actually going to have a rain garden day in partnership with Veolia Water, who is a contracted agency uh, for um, managing the wastewater treatment facilities. But they're actually sponsoring a rainwater uh, education, excuse me, a rain garden education day um, so that people can get their specific questions asked. Um, I can say for certainty that Earth Partnership is doing tremendous work in that area. Um, also, the, UNIT, the um, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Extension is also doing a lot of work in educating um, residents about how to create rain gardens. We also have uh, our Botan Burner Botanical Gardens that's also offering some of that education. So there's many agencies here that are involved in the movement here in the metro Milwaukee area. Um, but I guess the short definition is a rain, uh, rain garden is going to be dug deeper than an average garden. You're only going to use native plants and uh, with root systems that can tolerate high quantities of stand, standing water as well as drought. And when you stick with the native plants, that's generally what you're going to get from that. Yeah, so Karen, the, the idea with the rain garden is you uh, build a shallow depression, like uh, my parents just built one in their backyard, where the, uh, 
drain off the roof used to go onto the concrete and then into the street. And then my dad decided to just run it to a shallow depression in the ground and that water soaks into the ground and, and recharges the aquifer rather than just um, kind of overtaxing the sewer system. So the basic idea is that in cities, we've paved over so much and there's so much impervious surfaces that we've short-circuited the water cycle and we've prevented water from returning to the groundwater stage in our cities and rain gardens are a way of uh, kind of a biomimicry design to bring that back. Core, we have uh, uh, one, it's, it's not directly related to your previous set, but the question has come up twice. So mm -hmm. I'll ask, uh, what are your thoughts on fluoride in water and is it safe to drink city water versus well water? <laughs> that is totally out of my um, area of expertise. At Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewer District, we only treat wastewater. We're not responsible for the treating of drinking water. Uh, we have a separate um, entity that does that, and that's Milwaukee Water Works. Um, I believe if you go to milwaukee.gov um, to the water work section that they do have articles posted that address the whole idea of uh, fluoride. My personal opinion is um, it's, I, you know, I don't really have a scientific reason for saying yes or no, or no but I can give you one visual example uh, that I experienced uh, in a travel to uh, Tanzania. I noticed that there were a lot of people there, their teeth were yellow. And it's not because they weren't brushing their teeth, but it's because they did not have fluoride in their water and also because of some of the mineral deposits that occur naturally in their water. So from that, I would think, okay, if I can have something that helps me have whiter teeth, that's what I'm accustomed to. So I'm not totally opposed to it being there. Now, there was some legislation here in Milwaukee that uh, went forth and the result, uh, actually there was a, a lawsuit that went forth and out of it, um, it was kind of a 50-50 a split decision on it where they decided to keep the fluoride in the, the drinking water sources but not to, to reduce it but not totally remove it. So that's my limited knowledge about it. Um, um, now bottled water, I probably have the same information available to me as uh, as, as anyone else, I use the, the internet a lot for the most recent point of views on bottled water. Um, I've learned in some of, several, some of my readings that bottled water regulations are a lot more lax than it is for processing tap water. So um, I've become more confident in my tap water versus bottled water. I do use it for convenience when I'm traveling and I'm not sure what areas I'm going to be uh, traveling through and so forth. But for the most part, I, I'm very comfortable drinking the tap water here because I'm aware of all of the safeguards that are in place to alert the public if there is a particular problem. All right. Uh, I guess one quick question uh, from uh, someone listening in from Milwaukee. Court. Does your does the MMSD website have dates for the uh, drop-offs for the hazardous waste and the other, the medical is that on the MMSD website? Yes, it is. The medicine collection, I believe, is going to be April 26. Now, don't hold me to that, but that information you can find on MMSD.com. Um, and also for the Household Hazardous Waste, we actually do sponsor three year-round uh, facilities, and that information can also be found on our website. It's our mobile collection schedule that has not been released as of yet, but it is under development, and normally they kick off the mobile collection where we have the household hazardous waste vans going to various uh, lo locations in order to collect that hazardous waste. That usually kicks off sometime in April as well. Okay. Great. Well, again, we do have some, some other questions, but I'll hold them for now. Okay. And we can come. Uh, I will note that Dottie Painter would like, if, uh, if anybody listening knows of a school that has a green roof, like if your school or if, if you can type in and respond to Dottie's question if, if you're part of a project of that sort, which is not something I've seen much in schools, but it would be interesting to hear from the audience to type in if that's going on at your site. I'd like to suggest that she check the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh-huh. Their school, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, 
uh, on the inspiration slide that's at the end of this presentation, I placed a link to um, the San Francisco Bay Area where their um, Department of Public Works has a plan to bring green infrastructure to almost all of the schools in that area. And I have personally visited some of the schools. I think that they are, are way ahead of some of the other areas that I've seen. I can't say for sure if they have a green roof, but if there is one, uh, a school that has one, I think the Bay Area would be a great place to check. And one of our listeners did chime in, Hope McCarthy notes, uh, uh, Hope, I'm not sure if this is your school, uh, uh, probably is, Woodstock High School North uh, does have a green roof. So okay. if anyone wants uh, to talk to an expert, Hope McCarthy, one of our listeners, uh, could probably give you some information about a, a green roof at a school site. Hope if you, oh, it's uh, Woodstock, Illinois, she typed in. So Woodstock, Illinois High School uh, could be a source of information for people interested in that. So Cora, why don't we proceed along? We've got some more great questions coming in. I'll come back to those if we have time. Otherwise, we'll keep a record of those and try and get okay. back. All right, well, it's just a couple of more things I wanted to share. Now, this is one of the uh, more recent success stories that we've had of a school that's really, really just took the lead and it's a Maryland Avenue Montessori school. And um, unfortunately, the only information that I do have available is what was publicized um, uh, on Milwaukee Public Schools website, as well as Journal Sentinel, which is our major newspaper here in the metro Milwaukee area. But pr pretty much this was a project where um, they've transformed a 10,000 square foot asphalt parking lot into a 14, 14 thousand square foot um, environmental classroom and exploratory rain garden. Um, the, it enhances curriculum for multiple grades starting at K3 all the way through the eighth grade. Um, they are making cross-curricular -cur connections and integrating their learning. They're observing the water cycle. They are learning about different plant species by observing and the ecosystems that support them. Um, and they're also learning uh, the environmental benefits, the reduction of the stormwater runoff and the reduction in urban heat island effect. And this is an example of how they, di they uh, did it. First of all, they sought to incorporate into the school culture, which is one of the things that I mentioned earlier on. We have many, many wonderful teachers, um, and many of you are on this call who have exceptional skills, you make the connections well with your students, but um, for whatever reason, that kind of instruction is not permeating into the school uh, culture. Is it one person's job? Absolutely not, but that's a, the incubator concept that I'm hoping to inspire. Uh, it starts with one, and it can become contagious. It can spread to many. By including different things, um, that different ways, different grade levels can be involved. Um, in this case, uh, the Montessori, um, Maryland Avenue Montessori, at grades one to three, they have the curriculum set for what the, the students at that level are going to be exposed to. And then they have it for the, uh, set for the upper elementary grade students, and then for the seventh and eighth grade. And everybody has a role. And so the students are starting at one end and, and growing to the others. How did they uh, do this? The funding sources were actually generated from uh, a group of dedicated parents started the initiative, and they found a did uh, donations and fundraisers. They formed a chair non-charitable. Um, they formed a charitable organization to qualify for um, uh, grants and so forth. Uh, they got grants from the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program and the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, they also enlisted community donors. They got anon anonymous donors, and Whole Foods, I understand, was a major contributor to the project. And they got in-kind support from the public school district and also from uh, Midwest Landscaping that helped with a lot of the teachers in their outdoor classroom. $140,000 is no easy feat. It took them four years, so it wasn't, um, they were definitely passionate and they were motivated to get the project done. So now they have it and now they are using it as a classroom and probably are already establishing ways to grow it even more. Another strong example that we have here in 
metro Milwaukee area is the Hawley Environmental School. I couldn't recall the exact year that they were established, but I've had the pleasure of working, and this is one of the schools that MMSD actually adopted at one point, and we were able to give privileges to the students at this school uh, to tour uh, the Jones, our water reclamation facilities, even though they were underage, because these students had learned the maturity of uh, conducting themselves and, and being able to really fully comprehend what was going on at a wastewater treatment plant. Now, the picture that you see here with the students installing their prairie garden, they wanted to do a rain garden, but the um, they had too many restrictions, uh, too many barriers that they couldn't overcome in order to do the rain garden. So the next best alternative was to put in a prairie garden. And that prairie garden is still flourishing today. And I'm pretty sure it's been about six, seven years since um, they've had the prairie garden established. They also have a butterfly garden uh, that the students help to install. They have a lot of community and, and parent support, uh, which has uh, contributed to their long history. I mentioned nature centers, and we do have several of them, but Urban Ecology Center is the one that stands out the most to me uh, because of their urban connections. They've grown from one to three uh, locations in the metro Milwaukee area, and they provide, um, they support environmental curriculum to schools and community. Um, in each of the locations, they try to spread out to like a two-mile radius. Um, and what they do, they offer multiple field trips to particular schools so that the students get more than one um, exposure um, or environmental exposure opportunity. And it, the results have been phenomenal. Out of it have become an outdoor leaders uh, internship program. Uh, they're invoking more environmental stewardship among the students and all of the members of the organization, developing young science clubs and the like. And it, this is one example of many. We do have a lot of good ones, but um, uh, very good ones that are doing great work. But I particularly favor uh, Urban Ecology Center because of their urban connections. Now, Lloyd Street School Project, this is one to start off with excellent intentions. But this was um, some of the situations that happened here uh, were beyond um, anybody's control. Uh, there was a $100,000 investment made by EPA. And that the hope was that they would put in a rain garden and that there would be a curriculum attached to it and that students would be able to use it for years to come. But uh, the thing that happened was because of the changes in demographics and population and the school eventually closed. And when the school closed, we were left with um, what everybody else perceived as, why is this hole in the ground? Why are all of those weeds growing over there? Somebody needs to cut it down. Um, and pretty much that is what happened. It ended up mowed over, although the rain garden itself is still there. Um, and I have learned there's another school that's in the building, and this is new knowledge. I didn't change the presentation because uh, I just found out just yesterday that the school that's occupying, this, uh, occupying the building now, which is a charter school, it's a Milwaukee College Prep School, they are going to be restoring that rain garden, and they have great plans for making, making it part of the curriculum. So I was really, really um, excited to hear about that. But that's after about three or four years of dormancy uh, with this rain garden. And I, she, the teacher that I spoke to explained to me they had to mow it down because it had become a safety hazard. It was overgrown, and things were just out of, out of balance in the rain garden. So they're hoping to be able to start it over and um, make it part of the curriculum. But again, I use this example to show the contrast. When it's part of the school culture, it's likely to be sustained and will stay in place, uh, involving the citizens so that they know what's going on at the school. So that if something goes on um, at the school, um, in this case where one school closed, maybe there's enough people educated in the surrounding community that may take the lead and say, we need to maintain this uh, so that it still stays in good shape for future use. So in conclusion, getting everybody on the same page about what needs to happen in schools or at least um, operating from a similar mindset, it is not always easy. Uh, but the benefits far outweigh the challenges. Um, uh, incorporating a watershed incubator where ideas are born and where they are kept warm for future use. Um, 
really outweighs the challenges. You can improve your school culture. You can help your students involve a stronger sense of place and purpose. You can help them arrive at tangible solutions to environmental and community issues. You can help them be more consistent in what they're learning. Um, you can help them, help them have an intentional focus on the health of the watershed. And you can build stronger inter-community relations, a total win-win. Um, I want to take opportunity to mention one of the, and this is something else that's on one of the resources slides. We weren't able to show this video, but it was one that I was very, very impressed with. And that video is Schools That Change Communities. It's a documentary that was put together by um, uh, Dr. Bob Gleiner, um, where he looked, took five examples of service learning um, projects that were part of different schools, some elementary, some high school, some middle school. And in one example in particular, they had a program where students saw a problem. They found a creek that had yellow and orange stuff running through it, and they wanted to know what it was. Well, that sparked a whole curriculum from that particular school that the students not only traced the problem, found out what it was, it was actually pollutants that were coming from a nearby mine. Um, and they were able to work with that mining corporation in order to correct the problem, to be able to start uh, cleaning up that stream. And now that stream is flowing. It's healthy. And they also began to uh, plant stormwater trees from saplings. Uh, they raised those saplings and so that it continues to be part of the curriculum when the students reach fifth grade, they have the responsibility of digging up those trees uh, that they have raised from little seedlings and find that they work with the city and find vacant lots and they plant those trees in those vacant lots. And that opens up the space for other elementary students that come after them for they can begin their projects, where they can explore the science of trees growing and other greenery growing uh, throughout. So that whole concept of it starts here. It ends here. And the way you're using these natural resources in the environment are really making a positive, uh, having a positive effect on the health of the watershed. So if you get a chance, the trailer is online in, 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 in that link. But you may um, also order that DVD at, at, on that trailer. I thought it was very inspirational. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships are key. Sometimes when we look at all the work that needs to be done in a particular school environment and say, there's no way I can get all this done. But there are other people that are just as interested as you are in bringing about the type of change that connects students to their watershed. Partners, this is just an example of the partnerships that we were successful in establishing to deliver a professional development here. These are the teachers that benefited from it, and even to this point, we're finding that they're using that, they're super excited about what they learn, and it, that's going to be trans, it's going to just move forward um, throughout their, their careers in working with their students. Resources, we know, are another huge key. Uh, again, with these partnerships, you can find ways to make them available. Maybe everybody doesn't own their own, but you can find a way or maybe collaborate for a grant to purchase them where they're available on a checkout basis. So because you, we know that there are many, many resources that are key to um, outdoor studies. I would like to offer this particular book, if any of you are interested, um, number one, they're on our website. They can be downloaded. And it's just um, six booklets that give some of the uh, facts about the major watersheds here in the metro Milwaukee area. All the books are laid out the same. It even comes with a reference of how you potentially could use them, uh, use the books in the classroom, uh, mostly geared towards middle and high school students. Uh, students can use them for graphing. They can look at the differences in pollution sources in the respective watersheds that are represented. And maybe it would even inspire the creating of uh, some type of data like this um, or some type of illustrations like this that relate to the watersheds in your area. So you can look, take a look at the details on our website. And if you find that you would like to have a set of them or enough of them for your classroom, you can contact me and I can get those mailed out to you. And just a quick overview, I already talked about the schools that change uh, communities, um, uh, that DVD, and some of the reading materials that I mentioned here. 
I'd like to draw attention to the demonstration models, the Enviroscapes models. Those models have been worth gold um, for me taking into the classroom. They have everything from groundwater models to uh, hazardous waste models to wastewater treatment models, wastewater treatment and drinking water models. Uh, my favorite is the watershed model. Uh, it is such a powerful visual for anybody to really get a good understanding of what happens with uh, polluted uh, stormwater runoff. Um, and also the Project WET, Project Wild Alliance for the Great Lakes. Uh, and the last one that's listed here is the Testing the Waters, which is a regional resource for the Metro Milwaukee area. And the things that are listed here are the, just videos that you can view just for the sake of inspiration. And the Bay Area uh, Integrated Regional Water Management Program that I mentioned earlier, that's the link that's there for, um, for your viewing pleasure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cora. This has been a fantastic presentation. We've had a really active chat window of people exchanging ideas based on what they're hearing from you. Uh, okay. For those of you listening, if, you, if anyone has uh, other responsibilities to get to, we're at time. So if you have to run out, obviously, whenever you need to do that, we'll take uh, another few minutes, uh, about three to four minutes, just with some wrap-up questions. Okay. Um, I'll note that uh, Chad Segrist from Detroit uh, inspired a lot of conversation. He noted that there's a spring thing at the Detroit Institute of Technology in Detroit on April 12th, I think, if I got the date right. It's a launch festival for greenhouse renovation, seed propagation, plantings, urban gardens, and outdoor classrooms. So this is the kind of conversation that our webinars are meant to provide, is that you know, people listening from other cities can contribute and say, you know, this is what's going on in our location of this type, and then that inspires you know, people in that cluster from Detroit uh, who may not have known about that. Um, so Cora, thank you for kind of getting those kind of conversations going. Okay, great. We have uh, a lot of people were intrigued by the idea of the Urban Ecology Center that, you know, Nature centers are, have typically been found in suburban or rural areas, and uh, cities are have just as much many natural processes going on in different ways. And so, uh, your your slides on the Urban Ecology Center uh, were getting a lot of positive reviews of people mm -hmm. hoping to see similar things in their cities. I think okay. we have one question uh, about wa wastewater. That can wastewater be harmful? And I think the listener is getting at the idea of, you know, when you put the effluent back in Lake Michigan, what, you know, what, what is in that water or what's been removed from it? Okay. Well, I can say um, that there are uh, guidelines that are, are given down from the federal level, the, the local levels as well, uh, that govern. Uh, we have to operate within permit limits, so we can only release X amount of certain things. So certain things we have to make sure. Um, certain guidelines we have to make sure that we're reaching. Now, the wastewater treatment process is, does not remove every pollutant. Uh, for, I'll use pharmaceuticals as the uh, best example that I know of. Um, many of the um, deformities that they're finding on aquatic species, when they take those species back, whether it's a fish that's blind in one eye or missing fins or uh, frog missing legs, or in the case of finding um, male fish with female reproductive organs, the problems that are occurring are often traced back to pharmaceuticals that humans use. Again, great science going on that's figuring, trying to figure out what is, what is the problem. So it traced it back to the wastewater treatment facilities, and they really started looking at what can be removed, what can't. Um, that's one of the, the major motivations for MMSD and probably other water reclamation facilities throughout the country, implementing programs to try to keep excess pharmaceuticals out of the sewer system as well as household hazardous waste, things like uh, kerosene or if, even though you would think a person would, not, would know not to put it down a drain, uh, quite often the shortcut is taken. They want it out of their space and they may pour it down a drain, flush it down the toilet, or just take it up to an open storm drain, not realizing that it's uh, contributing, you know, to um, having an adverse impact on water quality. So controlling those things is, is really, really important to us. So that's why we educate the public more on 
and try to get them to understand the wastewater treatment process is not designed to remove pharmaceutical waste. Some of it can be removed, but the constant changes and what types of things people are taking, the concentrations in which they're using, uh, using these products, there it, it, we just can't keep up with all of that. Yeah, so the solution uh, is to try and keep those things out of the water in the first place with the, like the types of collection programs that you were mentioning. Like correct. Well, I think we're just about at time, Cora, so um, I'll wrap it up there, and <clears throat> Claire is keeping track of all the questions, and we'll post those that people were asking about that. We have a lot of people saying thank you, Cora, that okay. they really got a lot out of your presentation. Okay, and I remain available if people want to follow up with questions, and you pass those on to me. If there's something that I lack clarity, um, I'll please know that I can try to, if I don't have the answers, I do have wonderful professionals here that I can go and try to get the answers for you. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, and I'll Thank sign you. off here. Corey, okay. I look forward to staying in touch. Okay, great. Thank